The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello and welcome to The Week in Art, I'm Ben Luke. This week, the Italian far-right party Brothers of Italy heads for power, with culture and culture wars at the heart of its manifesto. Plus, the Carnegie International and Maria Bartosova at Tate Modern. I speak to James Imam, the art newspaper's Italian correspondent, about the cultural programme of the far-right party Brothers of Italy and its leader, Giorgio Maloney, which has given unusual prominence in their election campaign. The oldest international contemporary art show in the US, the Carnegie International, opens this weekend in Pittsburgh, and I talk to its curator, Sorab Mahebi, about the show and the institution. And this episode's work of the week is Endless Egg by Maria Bartusova, a sculpture in a new show that opened this week at Tate Modern in London. Before all that, you can still take advantage of our latest subscription offer. If you have a friend or family member who's going to study art, art history or another subject this year, why not buy them a gift student subscription to the art newspaper from just £25 a year? Visit our website, click subscriptions and select student subscription. Do also subscribe to this podcast and our sister podcast, A Brush With, wherever you're listening. Now, there's a disturbing trend of far-right parties gaining power or a share of power in Europe. In Swedish elections earlier this month, the Sweden Democrats, with neo-Nazi roots, was the second largest party and will now have a sway on government policy. In Hungary and Poland, hard-right governments have been in power for some years. And on Sunday, the Italians will vote in a pivotal general election and, according to polls, Brothers of Italy, the far-right populist party led by Giorgio Meloni, is set to lead a right wing coalition. Last month, alongside its continuing attacks on refugees and migrants, the party outlined its plans to transform Italy's art sector, including detailed plans for museums and the cultural economy. Bearing the title Culture and Beauty, Our Renaissance, the Brothers Culture Programme declares that the arts will be a cardinal strategic point of a Maloney-led government. I spoke to James Imam, a correspondent for the art newspaper in Italy, about the programme and why Brothers of Italy are placing such an emphasis on the arts. James, before we start talking specifically about the cultural programme, I'd like to start just by giving it a bit of background on Brothers of Italy and Meloni. What are the polls saying for a start? Well, um, the polls seem to be indicating a pretty comfortable victory for the right-wing coalition, basically, which Maloney is expected to to head. Uh, And if things go as expected, uh, she'll probably be governing alongside Silvio Berlusconi, a veteran political figure that uh, has been around for a while, and uh, also Matteo Salvini, who probably was the the celebrity hard-right politician um, in the previous election. The polls closed a few days ago. There are an embargo on polls in Italy for now, but it's looking like that coalition's about to take about 43% of the vote, according to, to a U-Trend poll, and that would be a comfortable victory for them. And Brothers of Italy is a relatively new party, is that right? It's a relatively new party, but with a long legacy, which stretches all the way back to uh, Mussolini's fascism, basically. One of its ancestors is the um, the Movimento Sociale Italiano, which was basically founded by some of Mussolini's uh, followers, people that orchestrated the March on Rome in 1922, which brought Mussolini to power. And that's really sort of credited with uh, keeping the spectre of uh, fascism alive in contemporary politics, because, you know, you had sort of neo-fascists or post-fascists, as they later called themselves, entering parliament. Um, That then became the National Alliance. And then a few years ago, Brothers of Italy was... Uh, was launched. Maloney seems to have really have become a big figure on people's radars, uh, I would say probably in the last 18 months, and her support has really shot up uh, recently, uh, not least when Mario Draghi became Prime Minister of Italy, and Maloney was really the only major politician that decided not to form part of Draghi's broad coalition, and, and we started to see her doing very well politically as a result of that. That's interesting because that's right. In in the most recent general election, actually, the Brothers of Italy were a very fringe party, weren't they? Something like four percent of the vote or something. 
Yeah. They got about 4% of the vote. They've really shot up now. I mean, they've been consistently polling over 20, perhaps even around 25 Uh, percent for a few months now. What we've seen is a real decline in support for people like Matteo Salvini, who looks like he could be finishing in fourth place after after the five-star movement. She's become the real star of the right. So what is it about her that has prompted that rise and Salvini's relative fall? Well, one of the main reasons that, you know, you often you often see banded around is the idea that she is sort of seen as a pure figure, really. I mean, coherent is, is a word that people were using over and over again when I attended in Milan one of her rallies, which I was reporting on. I think the idea that she hasn't covered any major political role as a leader, at least, um, I think means that she hasn't really had to compromise herself a great deal. Salvini seems to have really been rejected by parts of the right partly for doing things like forming coalitions with enemy parties in Draghi's coalition. He originally portrayed himself as an anti-European figure. He became much more pro-European as part of that coalition, especially after the start of the war. And I think people have been a bit disappointed by his performance. Um, I spoke with um, a member today, actually, for um, an article I'm researching, a a young member of um, Fratelli d'Italia, part of the youth uh, movement, which has really boomed recently. Something he said was that Maloney's rhetoric is quite close to a lot of normal people, especially young people. She sort of portrays herself as this quite rough and ready figure from, you know, the back streets of Rome, Garbatella, a sort of a rougher quarter of, uh, of Rome, who is quite sort of ironic and, and jokey and strikes a chord with people. So I think it's partly personal, I think it's partly political. And again, I think people sort of see her as almost the last chance, really, for, as Maloney puts it, reawakening Italy. OK, so let's now focus on the cultural programme, because one of the striking things about it is, I mean, I'm thinking about recent British elections. Culture has been minor almost to the point of invisibility in British politics to a degree in in election campaigns. One of the things that's really striking about Brothers of Italy is that they're saying that culture is a strategic cornerstone of what they do. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, I mean, you're absolutely right about culture being marginalised. I had a quick look at the the various programmes before coming on here, and um, there isn't really a great deal of of concrete new stuff in any of the other programmes. It does seem to play a major role in in the programme of of Fratelli d'Italia. Again, yes, a cardinal strategic point is is the way that it was described in an interview by a man called Federico Moliconi, who's sort of betraying himself as almost the culture guru of this party. And it seems to be, you know, a bit of a mix of sort of neoliberal policies almost, the idea of turning this huge industry um, in Italy that generates 85 billion euros a year into something that is more productive, more efficient, serves um, Italians better, and almost nationalist identity politics, that's the other side of, of things. And the way that they speak about culture, some of the language they use has sort of been picked up on by critics as almost being used as perhaps, you know, a weapon or an instrument to portray to the electorate and to the world, you know, what they stand for and who they are. But you're right, I mean, there are on their sort of online drop-down box programme what would be, I would say, the the equivalent of of pages and pages devoted to culture, with some concrete policies in there and some quite colourful language. Right. One of the things I was struck by is that some of these policies in terms of just pure cultural terms, seem very advantageous to things like museums. You know, there's sort of, they seem to be actively supporting museums as centres of learning. They seem to be very pro-museums, digitising their collections and making them available to the public. So there are sort of policies that one would, if they were sort of isolated from so much of the rest of their programme, actually be quite applaudable. Absolutely. And something they seem to be really keen on is, is bringing citizens into museums. I think something that Federico Moliconi mentioned when I spoke to him last week was the idea that, you know, tourists uh, go to museums, but Romans don't go to the Galleria Borghese um, or, you know, the other big places, uh, the other big museums in in, in the city. He wants to change that. And education is something that he spoke about. These places where we can create better citizens is something he mentioned. 
And, you know, they've sort of devised policies, including, for example, a reduction in VAT. So VAT in Italy is currently 22%. Uh, they want to bring VAT to 4% on what they're calling cultural products, which, which seems to include sort of museum tickets in a way that would make visiting museums a bit more affordable. They also spoke about keeping museums open later in a way that could incentivize people to visit museums after work. So making it easier for Italians to really draw on, on that rich heritage. The key point there is the kind of language that they're using around it, isn't it? Because what do they mean by sort of improving the citizenship? Is it tapping into the art collections and the extraordinary cultural resources of Italy as a source of nationalism effectively? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I think that really taps into how a lot of people seem to think Brothers of Italy work. They sort of allude to, to concepts with, I would say, probably quite precisely chosen language. Better citizens, perhaps, yes, could be interpreted by, by some people as the idea of creating a better, stronger, um, sort of more traditional nation. There are other bits of, of language in there that very clearly evoke the idea of of the nation. I mean, nationalism, nation is something that they mention over and over again. I mean, there's a policy in there, not wanting to get too technical, but there's um, the way that Italy gives funds to especially theatres and, and opera theatres. It's called the, uh, the FUS, so the Fondo Unico per lo Spettacolo. They want to rename that as the uh, Fondo per le Arti Nazionali, or uh, the Fund of the, the National Arts. So uh, nationalism, memory of the nation, which I think is quite an ambiguous uh, phrase um, in itself. And I've spoken to a few academics who've picked that sort of language apart, is really a key theme there. OK, so tell me more about that, because isn't that the sort of question where people are saying this is the kind of language that was used by Mussolini's fascists? There's a sort of language around what they're doing that has echoes of that time. Yeah, I mean, ancient Rome is something that keeps on coming back in that programme. This idea of re-evoking the memory of ancient Rome. That, for Mussolini, the memory of ancient Rome was, was essential to his ideology. You know, Roman architecture formed the basis of the rationalist architecture that, that thrived under Mussolini. You know, he called himself um, il duce, the ducks in Latin, the, the word for the leader. Um, and I think the idea of, you know, the Roman Empire as well really was, was big for Mussolini, who really, really worked hard on on building that empire in North Africa. And ancient Rome, yes, mentioned explicitly with the phrase re-evoking ancient Rome. It's also alluded to at the top of the culture section of their programme, where the idea of celebrating Christian Rome is mentioned. Obviously, Rome became the capital of the, of the Christian Empire under uh, Constantinople. And I think some analysts have looked at that and they've sort of said, well, you know, this is a, a subtle way of tapping into the sorts of ideas and themes that were, that were dear to Mussolini. Right. So in essence, are you suggesting that perhaps the idea of Christian Rome is somehow a kind of Islamophobic kind of idea and we know that there is a great antagonism towards Muslim people in the Brothers of Italy program right? Yeah so speaking to um, a cultural commentator and a professor of art history Tommaso Montanari that was definitely his interpretation. He said that uh, when he picked up the program he expected to see references to perhaps ancient Rome but not necessarily Christian Rome in light of some of the recent comments from Maloney who has said that she'd like to close ports to um, illegal migrants who um, at the rally that I attended a week ago in Milan describes illegal migrants as, as prostitutes and, and as drug dealers. That's the way that she characterised them. And also um, having recently caused a bit of a stir, a bit of controversy by, by tweeting a video of an illegal migrant raping a resident in the street. I think in light of those ideas which seem to point to perhaps a slightly more uh, racist standpoint, that phrase was interpreted as, as feeding into that and subtly pushing the idea that immigrants are a threat to Italy. And obviously Maloney has also taken a standpoint on LGBTQ issues, is that right? So one of the sort of hallmarks of some of these right-wing governments across Europe, like those in Hungary and Poland, for instance, has been a deeply homophobic approach to the LGBTQ community. Is that what you're sensing from Brothers of Italy? Is that going to be reflected in the cultural programme? Do you imagine there might be restrictions on so-called promotion of homosexuality, for instance? 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's so difficult to to work out exactly what the policies of Brothers of Italy are going to be when when they're in power. You know, at this rally that I keep coming back to, I, I, I bumped into a gay couple there who sort of said, well, you know, the idea that Maloney's homophobic is is rubbish. We really support her. We happen to also share her views on on immigration and religion and other things. So we'll see how things pan out. I mean, you know, Maloney's policies seem to be changing. She she you know was once very pro Russia and pro Putin. Before this election, she took great pains to distance herself from Putin. The same goes for family and LGBT rights. So when you say that's changed the idea of her attitude to LGBT rights, what do you mean by that? The point I'm trying to make is that Maloney's policies on on various things seem to be changing. We're speaking about a leader here who's trying, I suppose, to present herself as an institutional figure. And perhaps she's you know, trying to tone down some of the extremist parts of her image. In a recent video in which she spoke in uh, a number of different languages, including Spanish and English, uh, described herself as, as a conservative, more along the lines of a British conservative. So th- I think analysts at the moment are really trying to read between the lines when they speak about what Maloney uh, could do if and, and once she's in power. Certainly the family, you know, the traditional nuclear family is something that remains very important for her and something she speaks about a lot. When she speaks about Christianity, it seems to be a concept that's sort of bound together with the idea of the family. One way of interpreting that could be that perhaps LGBT rights aren't particularly important to her, and perhaps, you know, even threatening. I wanted to also ask about the art world's response. I mean, we know, as you you said, you mentioned academics that have very much analysed her thoughts and her statements in relation to the history of fascism. Has there been much comment from the art community? I mean, is is it right that museum directors, for instance, it's actually illegal for them to say anything in the run-up to the campaign? Yeah, um, so during the campaign, a public servant, and that includes museum directors as well, aren't able to express uh, political views. I've come into, you know, sort of radio hosts, for example, employed by Rai, the, the Italian version of BBC, who sort of said it's a nightmare, you know, you're sort of treading a political minefield. And often, you know, the, the way of dealing with that sort of thing by, by Rai is basically not to let <laughs> um, political campaigners on air, you know, if they're not directly reporting on the election. So I called a couple of museum directors asking for their comment on Brothers of Italy's uh, cultural programme, and, and they sort of say, you know, they basically can't comment on it. But I did speak to a few um, artists, um, including a, a contemporary sort of public artist, and also a woman called Alessandra Ferrini, who's a sort of a post-colonial sort of researcher analyst uh, and an artist based in London. And uh, there was a, quite a bit of alarm from some of the artists I spoke to about the way culture was perhaps being used to push sort of Brothers of Italy's ideology. And I think Ferrini in particular was very astute at analysing some of the language that was being used and some of the references that Moriconi, this this cultural guru, has been using in a few interviews in a way that she thinks could be quite damaging. And then, of course, Vittorio Scarbi, who is this sort of deeply controversial cultural figure in, in Italy, quite a sort of a public art historian, effectively, has come out very much in favour. Is that right? Yeah, so Scarbi is running his own campaign for the Senate under the Noi Maderati party, which I think would see itself as serving part of that right-wing coalition. He wholeheartedly supports the idea of opening museums later, involving Italians more in what goes on inside museums. He didn't seem to be too turned off by some of the the nationalist rhetoric uh, used for the party. He perhaps goes, Scarvi, this figure who is also a politician, he served as uh, the Under Secretary of Culture for Berlusconi, Uh, he's been uh, mayor of a a town in northern Italy for a few years, goes a step further by proposing that um, Italy makes its museums completely free to Italians and, and simply charges tourists more to cover the cost. He says that he was behind a study whilst uh, Matteo Renzi, the former prime minister, was in power and uh, found that, you know, by investing about anywhere between 100 and 200 million euros, Italy could make its museums free to Italians. Lastly, I wanted to talk about cancel culture, because that's something that they've been very clear in terms of the rhetoric about. And it mirrors a debate that we've talked about on this podcast before, but they have made very clear statements. And it seems to me that there's almost more like it could be legislation against cancel culture, as it's called. Tell us more about that. Yeah, Maloney proposed a law which would basically penalise people that damage statues much more severely, heavier fines, basically, which didn't get through 
that policy has made its way through back into the programme now. The use of the term cancel culture seems to be sort of used side by side with that of damaging statues, pulling them down, defacing them. So that, you know, the two concepts basically seem to merge there. And it's, it's kind of created this weird combination between the idea of protecting heritage and perhaps demonising those that want to damage that heritage, portraying them as almost enemies of the state. So the idea is that, yes, the party would come down hard on them. By merging those two terms, basically, uh, damaging statues and, and cancel culture, again, you start to wonder, what are they alluding to <laughs> when they speak about cancel culture? And, and how far does a policy like that develop from there to people that perhaps portray or express leftist views um, in other areas? Uh, are they going to be demonised? Uh, so I think uh, the use of that terminology has raised a few eyebrows. Well, James, thank you so much for telling us about this and we'll see what happens over the weekend. Thanks to you, Ben. Thanks for having me here. You can read more about the Italian election online at theartnewspaper.com and on our app for Android and iOS, which you can get from Google Play and the App Store. Coming up, the Carnegie International and Maria Bartosova. But first, here's this week's news bulletin. The Humboldt Forum, the controversial museum complex in Berlin, which first began to open in 2020, has now opened in its entirety, 20 years since its conception and at a cost of around 680 million euros. The 40,000 square metre complex located right in front of the museum island in the heart of the German capital may be materially complete, but the German culture minister Claudia Roth said that work inside and around the building begins now. She added that the forum will now move from being a subject of debate to a place of debate. A memorial to Queen Elizabeth II could stand on the fourth plinth in London's Trafalgar Square, the platform that's become the city's most prominent space for contemporary art. According to the Times newspaper in the UK, following the funeral of the late monarch on the 19th of September, government officials will begin discussing ways to mark the Queen's life and legacy, with the fourth plinth still seen as a possible location for a statue. Politicians have indicated that the space is being held for a commemorative statue of the Queen. But Michael Elmgreen, part of the Scandinavian artist duo Elmgreen and Dragset, who made a work for the plinth in 2012, criticised the idea. He said that the artistic contributions have made the fourth plinth the people's plinth and that it's no longer a suitable site for celebrating members of the royal family. And finally, the actor Brad Pitt is the latest celebrity to turn his hands to art. Pitt's showing his first works of art at the Sara Hilden Art Museum in Tampere, Finland, alongside works by the musician Nick Cave for the exhibition We until the 15th of September. Speaking to the Finnish publication Ule at the exhibition's opening, Pitt said of his artistic turn, For me, it's about self-reflection. It was born out of ownership over what I call a radical inventory of the self. Cave, meanwhile, is showing glazed ceramic figures depicting the life of the devil. The two fledgling sculptors created the works in dialogue with the British sculptor Thomas Hausgo. You can read all these stories and much more on the website or the app. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Christie's and Eon Productions present 60 Years of James Bond, an official two-part charity sale celebrating the 60th anniversary of James Bond on the silver screen. Featuring 60 iconic lots spanning vehicles, watches, costumes, props and experiences, the sales offer one-of-a-kind memorabilia bound to impress fans of the iconic British spy. James Bond fans can get a closer look at some of the lots at Christie's in London until the live auction on the 28th of September. Bidding for the online auction remains open until the 5th of October. Find out more about the lots and the two auctions at christies.com slash james bond. Welcome back. Now, the latest edition of the longest-running biennial-style exhibition in the US, the Carnegie International, opens this weekend in Pittsburgh. Established in 1896, the year after the Venice Biennale, the show is organised every three to four years by the Carnegie Museum of Art. The 58th edition, which is titled Is It Morning For You Yet?, is embedded in history as well as the present, with works from historical collections shown alongside commissions and recent works by artists working today. 
The lead curator of the show is Sorab Mohebi, and I spoke to him about the exhibition. Sorab, one of the th- most interesting things about taking on the Carnegie International is it's both its history and that word international. And it seems to me that you are grappling with both of those ideas head on in terms of your theme and your, your approach to the Biennale. Well, we tried. <laughs> so, yes, first international, Jeremy Benham, the person who came up with the idea of the Panopticon, also coined the term international when they were referring to an attempt to create like a, a kind of more universal legal infrastructure so that different countries in the world could use or refer to in terms of international matters. This became quite fascinating for me, something to really think about. How is it that the person who came up with this kind of um, concept of surveillance, which Foucault later used to think about the control society, was the same person who coined this term that we're using, and our exhibition is kind of uh, named after. So that was one thing that kind of struck a note. And then pairing that with the idea of the geopolitical imprint of the United States, which in a way became um, synonymous with the post-war order, which regulated essentially the monetary systems. And uh, after 1970, the dollar became the dominant currency in the world. So kind of like thinking about these in the background, I would say. Of course, within that context, you're exploring what international might mean to artists, of course, and asking them to find ways to situate that word within whatever it is that they're doing. And of course, by doing that, in partly you're inviting lots of international artists. But also, is it also about thinking about what it means to be international in the States right now? You know, you're in this institution, this grand institution. And it seems to me that the, the notions of what it means to be international in the States right now are pretty fraught, given the divided society. Um, yeah, so one idea around the Carnegie International and the kind of following the geopolitical imprint was to think about the movement of um, people, which would be kind of um, migration in a sense, and, um, but also migration of forms, of ideas and of images. So that was um, one way to think about this um, scope of this project. The other aspect that becomes as important is the kind of questions around artistic solidarity. So what other forms of international could be imagined? How artists in different times and in different places have uh, sort of engaged with emancipatory ideas around the world? That became an important aspect of the international. And lastly, I would say these forms of aesthetic engagement was a way to think about how we can, or how artists, or through the works of art, we can create a different imaginary, essentially thinking about different versions of the international. And in terms of this title that you've given, is it morning for you yet? I understand that's a kind of an alternative means of saying good morning in an indigenous American language. So tell me about that. What was it that prompted you to explore that particular notion? Absolutely. The, the title of the international is it morning for you yet comes from a Mayan Kakchikal way of greeting in the morning. Uh, we learned that from um, Edgar Kalal, who's an artist who's also um, participating in the international. It almost like immediately spoke to us as like a catchphrase because um, what it does bring out is this question of different temporalities. And um, one of the things that we can address with different temporalities is the question of, are we contemporary? Or are we together? Or do we share the same time? And if we do, then we are together and we can do things together and we can feel things together. So the question of, is it morning for you yet, was also to acknowledge, you know, our entire clocks are different. We might be feeling very differently. And also during the pandemic, it was also a way to address that, let's say, services, possibilities, healthcare, vaccine, were not equally uh, distributed around the world. So Mm -hmm. um, what time are we sharing is also what kind of infrastructure brings us together. So it was a way to think through, are we contemporaneous? Yeah. 
Yeah. And of course, the notion of the contemporary is elastic too, isn't it? Because I know that you have, for instance, artists that are no longer with us. And it's something I'm always mindful. I do another podcast, which is an artist interview, and people regularly talk about Felix Gonzalez Torres as if he is still very much present in our lives, you know. And he is, of course, through his art. So I'm wondering how you were thinking about the contemporary whilst involving these figures who, who are dead, you know, and but still have a kind of aliveness, if you like, to them. Yes, absolutely. The elasticity of contemporary also means when something starts speaking to us in this moment or starts kind of thinking about, you know, what is art today might not be art tomorrow or vice versa. What was not art before now might be considered art. But what this elasticity offers us is to see how time is obviously not linear and we are living in this moment, which is still essentially in the aftermath of what happened in in the long run of, let's say, human history. But obviously, we're focused on a particular period. So, um, for instance, we have works by the Asian-American photojournalist Nikki Arai, who is looking at the Asian activism, Asian-American activism in particular in the late 60s and early 70s, and thinking about the activism around iHotel and so on and so forth. But when you look at that work, you're like, these are the conversations we're having now. And we are continuing to have these conversations, yeah. You're in the Carnegie right now. You're installing the show right now. Tell me something about that space, because it's always struck me as a, a really particular space. It has loads of advantages, but it's also tricky, right? Absolutely. I like to say the architecture here is very porous. There are a lot of entrances and, and exits, and you constantly move from different historical moments. So when we think about the, the kind of um, neoclassical moment of this building and the original building that was built in 1985 and then the addition that was happening in, in 1974 and the kind of like the Heinz Architecture Center, which is like this Venetian agora in, in the middle of this all. So we are moving through different moments of, of architecture history in its different manifestations. So installing the show also helped us think through what modalities of curating we can think about as we look at these spaces, what kind of show we can have at the what is known as the Hall of Sculpture versus the kind of galleries or escape galleries where usually the historical material are mounted. So the, the install is also really responding to the possibilities of space. Tell me then about some of the works that you've been installing over these recent days. You talked about porosity of the, of the architecture. Is there a sort of porosity in the relationship between the works? Are you emphasising dialogue between the artists that you've selected? What's really amazing about the work of art in general is that no kind of curatorial conceit could really capture it. So the works really overwhelm our structures and our, the kind of limits of our thinking. And it expands them. There is intention behind install, but also it was a way for us to follow the works. But for instance, in, in our hall of sculpture right now, we have um, gold balloon bouquets by Banu Janatolu. Each of these bouquets is one article of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. So as the exhibition continues, they will deflate. So kind of like think about how rights are something that need to be protected we need to fight for them and we need to expand them and we need to upkeep them and kind of like to think about that at the heart of the exhibition was really important these works are surrounded by Hiromi Tishida's photographs of objects that survived the atomic explosion and bombing of Hiroshima so there are relationships um, but these relationships are much more expansive and porous as you mentioned and how we have like brought them together but, you know, there are little threats here and there. So, you know, if we're looking at 19th century building, we like to think about romanticism. You know, we can't help it. <laughs> That's great. And would you say that, therefore, that romanticism is a strain in contemporary art that is at the surface, that is common to lots of artists working now? If we think of another reading of romanticism that does not take pain out of the beautiful if it doesn't separate the sublime from the beautiful, let's say. So if we think about that, we can look at how a lot of artists are thinking about issues from protecting rights 
they're thinking about the kind of rising authoritarianism in the world or the climate emergency, we can see that there is a new kind of way to think about some of those lines of thought. Although I would say the problem with romanticism as a terminology might be that it will really take us essentially back to a very particular history of thought, which we don't want to emphasize. So. I wanted to ask you about the curatorial structure, because one of the things that we've seen over the summer, for instance, is that we've got the Venice Biennale, which is a very singular vision in terms of Cecilia Alemani's vision, but she's brought in, of course, lots of other people to think around it, lots of thinkers and, and, and art historians who've contributed, and she too has looked back at the past to a certain extent. You've then got Documenta, which has created an enormous amount of commentary, which has been curated by a collective and for other collectives. Obviously, you are the lead curator. There's other curators that are directly involved on a day-to-day level, but you've also got a kind of curatorial council. So tell me about that plurality or polyphony of voices that you've brought in. Well, essentially, every exhibition is a collaborative process. Um, The curatorial one aspect of it, for sure, but you can't have an exhibition without all the labour that goes into it uh, from many different departments, different people. Most importantly, an exhibition is a collaborative effort where artists contribute to it. So we follow the work to make the show. So even when we think about, let's say, one figure who is in charge of a show, I don't think it could ever really be like that because it's really different voices coming together in an exhibition. In our show, I really um, do think there has been a, a great collaborative effort between Ryan Inoue, Talia Hyman, and myself in kind of like thinking about a lot of threads of the show. And I think the input of our curatorial council with um, Pablo Jose Ramirez, um, Rene Mbaya, and Rob Oxhorn and Freya Chow has been really important for us, especially because we really try to think about the uh, histories that precede the contemporary as a genre of making. So that was really important. Second, it was a moment during the pandemic where travel was not as easily possible. And also our group of advisors are let um, Koinon Tran and Renan Laurent and Tiago Paolo de Souza who have also been contributing uh, a lot to our show. And so in essence, as you say, through that collaborative effort, the artists then add to the collaboration, right? So in a, in a sense, they complete that collaboration and, and it's, it's that manifestation that most mm-hmm. of the public see in a way the curatorial thoughts and structure behind it are the sort of framework, if you like, for, for what the public sees. And, and therefore, as a member of the public, you can engage in whatever depth you choose with those curatorial ideas, would you say? Sure, yes. I definitely think that's a great way to put it. The other thing that I would add to that is that we create a structure to question it and to break it. I think that needs to happen, you know, and <laughs> that structure is a way for us to give us a direction to open up a current and then... We cannot contain it as much as maybe it appears to, uh, you know, that's a great lesson of post-structuralism, that the center is empty. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, well, Sarah, thank you very much for talking to me today. A great pleasure, and thank you so much for your time. The 58th Carnegie International Is It Morning For You Yet runs from the 24th of September to the 2nd of April 2023. And finally, it's time for the work of the week. Maria Bartosova was born in Prague, but spent most of her career in the Slovak city of Košice. There, she created a distinctive body of work, mostly in plaster, which she occasionally cast into other materials. Her work was made with unorthodox techniques, including the use of balloons. Numerous sculptures made in this way feature in the exhibition of Bartosova's work that opened this week at Tate Modern in London. Among them is Endless Egg from 1985, and the co-curator of the exhibition, Juliet Bingham, told me about this sculpture. Juliet, we're going to talk about a work called Endless Egg, but I think first I want to talk about balloons, because this is an example of a work that was made using balloons, but I think we need a broader context to the balloon-making methods, because as far as I understand it, this is a pneumatic casting, but she also had an, an earlier form of casting with balloons, is that right? Yes, that's correct. So Maria Bartosova is known for her white plaster works either very full and heavy forms 
or later very open, shell-like, fragile creations. But all of these were made using brightly coloured children's balloons. So there's an interesting, you know, dichotomy there between the final product and this um, very malleable, playful rubber uh, form that she used to cast in. So in the early 60s, she had taken on many uh, commissions for public works, which she used to support herself and her family. And she had very little time in the studio. Uh, and she came to a kind of realisation while playing with her young daughter with a ball that she could actually use a balloon to cast with. And this allowed her to work with the very fluid and um, fleeting and quick nature of plaster as a medium and to create this kind of very tactile way of making. She coined a term gravity stimulation in which she poured plaster inside balloons and also used condoms and then used gravity or sometimes submerged the forms underwater to create these very haptic shapes. Indeed. And if you really want to touch them, don't you? I can't tell the audience how much I've spent the whole time walking around this show desperate to hold these items. They're so sort of enticing and covetable, aren't they? They are. They're very sensual. There's a kind of inherent physicality in the works. And I have to say that I was very envious of Tate's incredible art handling team during our installation process because they are indeed the only people allowed to touch the works. Curators are strictly forbidden. So, yes, there is a kind of sensuality to her forms. And she also made works which were designed to be touched and interacted with. They're interlocking pieces that she called haptic folders or jigsaws. And they were used in workshops with blind and visually impaired children so you know inherent in her certainly her earlier pieces is this direct engagement with the work and in terms of the sort of forms that she related her sculptures to it's it's very broad but it's a range of natural forms essentially isn't it it's it's the body and nature together Yes, she was very inspired by the natural world and by the cycles of life. So there are those threads which very clearly run through the work from her germinating, bursting, sprouting forms to other works that more directly evoke the body. But they're all abstract, not kind of clearly abstracted from nature, but more a sensual and innovative exploration of sculptural form. So her whole career was spent transforming matter and and shape and creating these kind of relationships between form. Indeed. So pneumatic casting then, this second sort of innovation of balloon casting that she did was effectively she poured plaster onto the outside of the balloon. Is that right? That's correct. So whereas touch remains an important component in the earlier technique and the later technique, in the later technique, she used her breath as material. So she would blow air into balloons and then, as you say, pour the plaster over the side, sometimes embedding gauze into the structure. And this allowed her to to create these um, shell-like or cavity-like forms. So this dialogue that she had between dualities, so positive and negative, hollow and full, and she talked about the different material properties also evoking emotional responses. Yeah, and she sort of embraced the fragility of this process, didn't she? Rather than in trying to create these perfect forms, she embraced the fact that they would break, that they would fracture, and it was a sort of essential part of both the making and the subject matter in a way. Yeah, I think that as her life unfolded, her later works also, in a way... (laughs) mirrored some of the personal circumstances of her life and challenges within her relationship and interest in these problems of existence, in illness and stresses and also interrelationships between individuals but also mankind and nature. So ecology was very important to her and her relationship with the natural world. And later on, she made works which were ephemeral. So, for example, she placed uh, objects into the tree in her garden these kind of broken egg-like forms. So I think certainly she was reflecting on life and and the cycles of life as she had in her earlier works. But the works did take on a more kind of precarious nature. So the work we're talking about, Endless Egg, it's effectively a series of broken fragments, right? Yes. I mean, in a way, it combines both of her techniques because it uses gravity stimulation as well as pneumatic casting. And it's a really one of her most kind of complex constructions in which eggs are placed inside of eggs and the forms appear to be indefinitely growing. 
And this idea of eternity and infinity was very important to her, particularly in her readings around, you know, ancient traditions and Eastern philosophy and uh, her interest in scientific thought. And in a way, the endless eggs or infinite eggs relate very much to her interest in time and cycles. So can you describe what we're talking about then in this instance? Well, the form of the work is oval shaped, larger than her earlier works, which could be held in the hand. And it has a kind of cracked surface and an egg appearing within an egg. So she would have cast, some of it would have been cast inside the balloon and others would have been cast and submerged underwater and kind of intricately placed together. She also made reference to this in a really lovely quote. And she said, I'm preparing objects in which I would use the technology and principles of layering and growing, cracking of moulds on the female torso, something like a contemporary Madonna or the Venus of Willendorf. And I think this relationship to fertility and motherhood is really important because there's definitely a thread, interconnectedness and relationship with the body that runs through her practice. And there's a sensuality, which you can see in her early works, which is then reflected in this Endless Egg series. And that's one of the most interesting things I think about the work is that you can read it from the inside out or the outside in to a degree. So as well as broken fragments, this could look like layers that have been stripped away to a core, I always think. And and therefore, one sees it, yes, as an egg, but also you can read it as a womb with an embryo and so on. Can't you? And she's very influenced by the things that happen to her own body, right? The experience of pregnancy informed lots of her work. Is that right? Yes, that's true. So one of the earliest works in the exhibition is an untitled aluminium cast, which she made in 1961, originally in plaster. It was cast inside a condom, and at the time she was pregnant with her first child. But in her drawings, she wrote about this as a tree swaying in the wind. So it has this kind of dual possibility. I think she had an interesting and also complicated relationship with her husband, who had spoken of her work being purely abstract without any other external references. And I think for Maria, there was a deeply personal, very kind of, in many ways, kind of erotic and sensual form to the work, which wasn't explicitly acknowledged at the time, but you can very clearly see these yeah, fleshy bodily references and there is a kind of trajectory in the work from very full and bursting forms at the beginning of her practice to these rather hollow fragile spaces which can be seen as places of rebirth and she talked about that a bit in the 80s about you know a kind of depression and in the quiet of her depression she could find solace in a shell and she talked about herself as being a nest in a tree and seeking places of refuge. So I think, yes, the work is very multifaceted in the way that you can look at the metaphorical associations within it. And that's one of the things that's so striking about the exhibition. It's partly through the very beautiful way that it's displayed, this incredibly spare show. And of course, there's very little colour there as well. But it seems to me that if her art was a kind of soothing process to a degree or a cathartic process, it too, as a viewer, is a very soothing exhibition to see. And that's sort of really telling when you do see those photographs of the workshops with the blind people. Because for them, the satisfaction that you're witnessing in those photographs as they're touching these objects seems very, very clear, doesn't it? Yes. I mean, there's a really kind of joyful expression of all the participants taking place in the workshops. And we're really fortunate to have been able to include never seen before photographs taken by art historian Gabrielle Kladek, who was a one time close collaborator with Maria. And he helped to organise workshops in 76 and 83 with blind and partially sighted children, really to bring her already existing interest in kind of haptic perception and different ways of experiencing the world. And there was a very, yes, active engagement with her sculptures. And she talked about different psychological expressions, so round and warm and cold and hard edged. And she very much saw these as objects which could be part of a kind of learning process, but also very playful and part of enjoyment and a kind of puzzle that would take a long time to unfold. There definitely is a playful strand that runs through her practice. And I think also, you know, relating again to her later technique of pneumatic casting and her use of her own breath, there's a very interesting quote. She said, my breath is part of the universe pulsating. 
And ecology and the natural environment was very important for her. And in the way that we can have a kind of tactile response to something, but also be interconnected through our relationship with the earth and the environment was important, not only in the sense that we're grounded when we stand on the earth, but that we all share the same air and that we are all interdependent. So I guess this goes back to this idea of cycles of life and infinity. I think there's a really hopeful message somehow in her work about man and the environment. Indeed there is. When she made this sculpture, what was her reputation in the art world? She was in Slovakia making work. Was there a sort of a critical kind of structure around that scene or was she making them more for herself than for an audience? So she had a very interesting career. She studied in Prague and was born in Prague, met her husband, sculptor Juraj Bartusz there, and he was born in Kemenin in Slovakia. So they moved first to Kemenin and then to Kozice, which was an industrial city away from the art world centre. So in a way, she worked in a fairly secluded environment, but also something to do with her own personality and her own way of making. And she referred to her works as my own sculptures. So she really, in a positive sense, was able to develop her process and her way of thinking and working in a very thoughtful and considered and concentrated way. She only had a handful of opportunities to exhibit in her lifetime. So the second solo exhibition took part in 88 and a number of the works, well many of the works that we've included in our our exhibition were included in her 88 show which she installed and curated herself. So the endless eggs, the bound oval forms tied with string, an incredible installation in the window of the gallery space, which holds these very um, flesh-like plaster objects suspended in space. All of those were there. And I think she didn't achieve the recognition in her lifetime that her work really warrants. And there's been a slow build since her early death in 1996 of international recognition of her work. And that's kind of sparked by a number of artists and curators in Slovakia who've really championed her practice. So contemporary artists like Roman Ondak, who's represented in Tate's collection, and Denisa Lohotska and Boris Ondrajka have all been artists who've really advocated. And then Slovak National Gallery held a show in 2005. And since then, really when her work appeared in the documenter in 2007, it's kind of garnered more international recognition. It's a much-deserved level of attention. Thank you, Juliet, for telling us about this wonderful artist. Thank you so much, Ben. Maria Bartosova is at Tate Modern until the 16th of April next year. And that's it for this episode. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Amy Dawson, Henrietta Bentle and David Clack. And David also does the editing and sound design. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to our guests, James, Sorab and Juliet. And thank you for listening. See you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.